Hey, it's Derek Tupker here of Bestseller Secrets with Tessa Smith McGovern. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that I know applies to uh, just about every writer and author, even the most experienced ones, uh, something that uh, almost everyone goes through, and that is self-doubt. It's the, the voice in your head. It could be saying, uh, what if this isn't any good? It could be the imposter syndrome of, you know, who am I to write this? Is, is anyone going to like it? Uh, how do I even know if what I'm putting out there is, is good or not? And there's all these questions that, you know, the, the mind can play tricks on you. And I've seen this even talking to some of the top authors, some of the top writers, some people who are uh, top of their field in almost any area, they still have that self-doubt that can come up. And even if you gain a certain level of confidence in your ability, then you go and you try to take on a new challenge or a new, uh, you know, whatever uh, milestone that you're trying to hit. And whenever you're going to that next level, the self-doubt can kick in. And so what I found is that uh, you know, you can talk all the marketing strategies in the world. You can talk all the little uh, practical tips and tricks. But if there's that self-doubt that is you know, secretly sabotaging someone, then that can lurk beneath the surface and actually hinder your effectiveness in anything else that you're doing. So really important to gain this self-mastery, understand how you work with self-doubt. And that's what Tessa is uh, going to help you with here today. She is uh, an author, award-winning English writer and coach. Uh, so she uh, works not only with her own writing, but also works with other authors and writers in terms of how to how to overcome, uh, not only produce a great book, but how to overcome this self-doubt. So welcome, Tessa. Hi, thanks, Derek. Nice to be here. Yeah, glad to, glad to have you on. And so you mentioned uh, to me, you know, a number of things that you're, you're wealth of knowledge on a lot of uh, areas, but especially you mentioned this topic of self-doubt, and I knew that this would be a, a big issue. So imagine someone comes to you and I go, you know, Tessa, I, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm working on a book. I just, I don't know if it's any good. I kinda, I'm doubting myself. I kind of feel like I'm, uh, I see what these other writers doing. They're so much better than I am. I feel like, what do you say to someone whenever they come to you and they're in that situation? So the, the first thing I would say if someone said that is to chunk it down and stop thinking about the whole global situation. You know, I want to have a bestseller and I want it to be like something Neil Gaiman would write or whatever that ambition is in our head because the building blocks of writing are small wins. They're the daily going to the page, which we all know that. Um, but the thing is that self-doubt stops us from getting to the page each day. And um, the first thing to know about self-doubt is that it is it actually can be useful um, because it's an indication, like you said, when you're doing something new, you're always going to have that sense of self-doubt, but you can always have it also you can have it also when um, you're just uncertain. You know, you're writing a first draft and you don't know if your conflict is going to be compelling enough or you don't know if the character is interesting enough. So um the thing to remember is that self-doubt is not an indication of quality of your prose. I mean, you know, more advanced writers know that because they go back to their chapter, their story that they wrote when they were feeling horrible about it, and they see, yeah, it's actually no better and no worse than my other, other first drafts. But that fear of that feeling can be enough to stop us getting to the page in the first place. So... Um, you know, like I was saying to you, Derek, there, there actually is a, there isn't a magic bullet for most things in this world, but there actually is one for getting words on the page, and that is the writing sprint. Because when you come together in a, with a group of people who are all writing, somehow it's easier. You know, that group energy um, and the fact that everybody is doing, trying to do the same thing. You know, we're trying to write something true. We're trying to write something deeply felt, and we want to deliver it to readers. Um, and in the group, um, with the, the sprint that I run, I give um, guidance. Because one of the downsides of writing a sprint is, um, and you'll have had this experience if you've done sprints, sometimes you can just write something random. You know, you can write something that's not like anything else that you write, which is fine sometimes. You know, sometimes you want to branch out, you want to do something differently. But sometimes if you're working on a 
either a collection of stories or a series of chapters for a larger work, you want to sort of keep it under the same umbrella and have it be useful. So, um, you know, it's good if your sprint can include that kind of guidance. Um, so it's not an indication of quality. It's an indication of your emotional state or what you're trying to do. So sprints are one way around it. I, I want to emphasize something that you said, a couple of things that you said here that's so important. And I, I want the, the listener to just really get the impact of this. What you're saying is that, uh, you know, self-doubt is not an indicator of quality. So sure. I've heard a saying like, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> so yeah. don't believe everything yeah. you think or feel in the sense that someone goes, it, you know, doubt, um, doubt can be useful is, is also what I'm hearing you say. And that's what I've learned too, is that it's not like um, doubt can, can be the kind of thing and it's setting up why the sprints can work is it can say, I might not be the best judge of my own work. In fact, I would say that's often uh, the case where someone isn't going to be the best judge. And it's just saying, I don't know, like if I'm writing something, I don't know if this is clear or not. I have my doubts, but that's why I'd want to get feedback, why I'd want to run it by readers or an editor or other people uh, like like that. So it's so important to get that self-doubt. It's not a sign that there's something wrong with you. It's not a sign that you're just like, oh, you don't have what it takes. It just might mean that you, uh, it's just a signal going on in your head. And a lot of times I found that uh, you use the word uncertain. If you've never written something um, before in a certain genre or a kind of new territory, you're not really going to know how to judge it. That's why it's no. so important to get outside. Yep. Right. And, and well, and any time you're writing something, you think you might set out to write something, but you may end up writing something a little different. So, you know, I always think of it as being in the fingers. It's like the fingers know better than the mind does because they just pop out what they want to. But actually what that is, is it's the stories coming from your subconscious mind. You know, your subconscious knows everything you could possibly need to know about writing stories. It's the mind and all our judgments that we have to sort of circumvent. Um, I think that once you get used to the idea that self-doubt can be helpful, it's not something you want to get rid of altogether because it does keep you safe, but it's basically your reptilian brain saying, oh, this is something new. I don't know if it's okay, so hold on. Hmm. That's what it yep. is. Yep. And so that's, that's such a, a key point to get. So if, you, if you're experiencing, if you're listening to this and you have some of that self-doubt uh, come up, it's normal. Uh, it's not uh, saying that it's, it actually means anything about your book. It's just saying that, uh, or about your writing, it's a signal. And then that segues into what you're talking about with the sprints, which is there's a multitude of benefits. But I want to make sure this is also clear. Another reason why I wanted to jump in was, can you define what a sprint is? Uh, and then go into some some more of the benefits of it. Yes, a sprint is where you start writing for a set amount of time, and it can be any amount of time. It can be five minutes, 10 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. And basically, you're going to write as fast as you can, trying not to stop and trying not to cross out, which is really hard, but doing your best. Because the faster you write, the more likely you are to outwit the critical editor in your brain and access the subconscious at the back. Um, you know, it, it's not as difficult as it sounds. The, the thing to do is to think about the character. This is the advice that I always give is if you have a character that you care about and if they're in a situation that you want to save them from ultimately, um, think about them. You know, don't think about yourself and your writing and am I getting this right? Because you are not really the focus at this point. You are the, the vehicle, you know, you're the conduit. Um, so the thing to do is to, to focus on that character. The other thing that we do have to know in order to settle the reptilian brain down is that we have a system that at some point when we're ready, we're going to show that work to someone else and we're going to get other trusted and expert layers of different levels of feedback on it. So we know that even if we are trying something new and we don't know how to do it and maybe we're going to do it inexpertly, we have the systems in place to make it something good as we go through various revisions. 
Yeah, that's great. So a couple couple key points there. Uh, the way you put it, I haven't heard it ever described this way, and it's I think it's really smart, uh, especially for a, a fiction author, is you're focusing on the character and you're like you're the vehicle of which the story is unfolding and, and thinking about that. And really, I could say the principle behind whether it's self doubt or fears or a lot of these things where you're you're in a person that's kind of getting in their head is to take the focus outside of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see the word self-doubt. So there's a focus on self. Am right. I good enough is what I'm, you might think, well, is what I'm producing good enough, but it's still usually kind of a, a personalized connection to it. Whereas you go, uh, for me as a nonfiction author, I'm thinking about the people that I'm wanting to help with it. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. It works for nonfiction authors just as well, because ultimately, we're not writing for ourselves. If we were writing for ourselves, we would just journal and we would never speak to anyone about it. It wouldn't be an issue. But for nonfiction and fiction writers, we want to reach the reader and we want to help them. You know, I mean, with some of us are clearer than others about how and why we want to help people. Very often people who write memoirs have a very clear sense of why, you know, they've been through something, they want to help people who are going through the same thing. But it's the same with fiction because, you know, whether readers are aware of it or not, we read for survival, we read to thrive. And so the people who are writing those stories, the, the best way, one way to focus outside of ourself is to Remember that fear comes from the brain and from the ego. And so if our attempt is heart-centered and if we are writing because we have a reader in mind that we want to help, then that can help you sidestep the fear because, again, it's not about us. It's about someone else who's been living with guilt or whatever the issue is and your words on a page can give them relief, can be, you know, balm to their soul. And so... Um, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a waste of time to let self-doubt take over. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're getting outside of yourself. And then when you get outside of yourself, you get outside of the self-doubt and, uh, in also the way you describe it, it's like, you are this, this vehicle or this instrument of which it flows through you. Uh, it, you know, the story or the insights or whatever it is, is flowing through you. And then uh, you also mentioned there, this is so key, you gain confidence when you know that it's not all on, on you in the sense of you're going to have readers or an editor, or multiple people who can, who can help uh, flesh it out and, and shape it up. And for me, that's like I'm working on a book right now, and there's plenty of times where I'm like, I don't know if this is clear. I don't know. I'm getting images made. I don't even know if anyone's going to understand what these images mean. Uh, like, but I'm just like, that is, you could call it doubt or uncertainty, but the relationship with it is different because I don't go, that's a problem. I just go, yeah, I don't know. I, I won't know until I get the feedback on it, which is fine because you have that, like, you know, what's coming up. You know, that there's going to be people who will help get, you know, you'll get the outside eyeballs on it. You'll get the, the information from other people if it's clear. And now all of a sudden you can gain the confidence that comes. It's like borrowed confidence. You're borrowing from, uh, I look at it like from coaches. Like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I trust my coach who's going to give me good feedback. So it, it gives you that extra reassurance. And it's also understanding that, um, we live in a, not to get overly philosophical, but the whole world is interdependent. Like you need the trees for oxygen. The trees need your carbon dioxide. We all are like working together in this big, you know, interconnected 100%. collaborative type of approach. And so you go, oh, your writing is a co-created uh, process. Uh, it's a collaboration. And as you take that mentality, now there's not so much weight on yourself. Uh, just enough to like get it done and, and produce it, but also recognizing that you're going to have some of that, um, that outside feedback and guidance. A hundred percent. And we're not in the habit of asking for help um, generally. You know, I, I think in, in particular in America, I think the culture is very much you have to get to it, you have to do it, you know, you're not supposed to 
really just say, ah, I'm stuck. I need help. Like, I mean, with the pandemic, I just realized that I need help in all kinds of different ways just to make things easier, not because I actually can't physically do something myself, but just because it makes it better if I can get help. And what I will say is that most writers don't realize just how rigorous the um, traditional publishing model of editing is. The books that you see out there have gone through, um, this, these are the later stages of revision and polishing, you know, it is rigorous and it is executed by editors who are working for bosses at publishing houses who don't care what you think and they don't care about your feelings they might you know they might be able to couch things nicely but they might not you know and and anyone who goes into traditional publishing has that experience and is the better for it but that's way down the line you know when you're when you've got to get to the page you have to be kind to yourself you have to be gentle excuse me and the more loving that you are to yourself the easier it will be and the more words you will get yeah beautifully put in this the idea of asking for help is is key that comes down to i think a core issue is this idea of like yeah you're gonna need help um whether that's feedback whether that's uh, coaching mentorship uh, training, you know, all of this sort of stuff. That is another upside of self-doubt is if you take it, let's completely remove self-doubt and say someone just goes, they have absolute certainty in everything that they do. Well, there's people who have that and they become, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're delusional or they're, uh, yeah. egomaniacs. They're like, everything I do is perfect. It's like, but you can't really know that, but yeah, so that's the, the extreme side of it. So having a little bit of, I'm not, I'm not totally sure if this is going to work or not. That can be a healthy, uh, in, in the right doses, can actually lead to some humility and helping compel a person to be open uh, to getting help. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I want to dive in as we, as we start to finish up here, because um, I mean, we could go on for hours and hours about this, but I know you have some more resources where people can, can get some, some help. You do have a process called the Magic Roundabout. Can you share a little bit about that and how this helps uh, writers and authors? Yes, the the Magic Roundabout. I called it that because um, it says playtime to me, and I and in the early stages of our writing, I think. <clears throat> excuse me. If we're ready to play, then it makes life so much easier. Um, so the idea is that it's one of those roundabouts that just turns very gently in the ch- a children's playground. You can hop on and you can hop off with ease. And it has the stages. I have a graphic that I'm happy to share if you'd like it. But it has the stages of writing. So the first stage is getting inspired. <coughs> Excuse me. The second stage is writing your first draft. The third stage is revision. And there are some tweaks, you know, these are not brand new stages, but the ways that we approach these stages, we can do it in a way that it's hard for us and it shuts down our flow, or we can do it in a way that makes it more fun and makes it possible to relax and also possible to not keep thinking, I'm not writing enough, this isn't good enough, Um, you know, and and so many of the writers I work with, I um, teach at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence and also online um, for the Westport Library. And so many of the writers that I've known over the years just write stories and then they leave them. You know, they don't follow through with the editing, they don't submit them, or they might submit them and they get rejected a few times and then and then they leave them. And, you know, this is, it, to my mind, this is a type of self uh, sabotage. It's a it's a kind of um, shooting ourselves in the foot because the creative process is part of our essential self. You know, it's everybody has it, whether it's writing or songwriting, art, whatever it is. Um, and we don't have to think of it as this fancy thing. It's just part of life. You know, we are creative beings. Um, and I really think that the system, if you understand it from soup to nuts, you can use it to get through the writing process and have fun in a relaxed way and and not have the guilt, I'm not writing enough or I'm not publishing enough or my stories aren't good enough. You know, I was just, I was sick of it. I'm sick of it. And, you know, being in the pandemic, um, I 
was able to write more and I was able to sort of sit down and it was actually one particular event that happened that pulled all this together for me, which was that I stepped off the roundabout myself and I made a mistake. So I had switched genres to writing fantasy and I like to think maybe this is my excuse for why, but I actually sent a writer who I adore. I'm an absolute fangirl of this writer whose name is Nina Kariki Hoffman, who is a sweetheart and a wonderful writer. And because of the pandemic, I was in a, able to be in a sprint with her. I sort of tracked her down, you know, thinking maybe she's teaching. Um, and so I was in this writing session with her. And after a few months, I asked her if, if I could um, hire her to edit my piece. And she said, yes. And I sent it to her. And I sent it to her without rereading it, without, um, you know, I just, I can't believe that I did this, but I sent it to her. And when we sat down together, she said to me, I hope you're ready for this. And she completely tore this story apart. And I think there was one paragraph at the very end that did not have like writing all over it. And, you know, she was an absolute, kind, kind person and said to me, you know, I don't really think it's worth rewriting. I would just start again if I were you. And I was mortified that I had done this. And I, you know, I've been writing and publishing for a long time, <laughs> decades. Um, 96 was my first published story. And I thought, how on earth did I do that? And, and so this concept of the magic roundabout came into my mind where I just, I got off the roundabout with that story too soon. You know, I didn't get the feedback. I didn't get the expert um, help on it that I should have done before I sent it to her. Um, I didn't want to send her something that was, you know, first draft. Um, I was I was hoping, of course, that she would read it and go, oh, this is wonderful. Um, but so that's how the Magic Roundabout came together. I really realized that no matter how you've been writing, it's easy to fall off or out of the system that can make it productive and fun and, you know, help you write the best stories that you can in an enjoyable way. So that's how it came about. Yeah. So, uh, and for those, so roundabout, um, you're thinking of like the playground, right? Is that what you're talking about? Which I think in, in the United right. States, we'd call that a merry-go-round. Uh, you would. Think, You'd call yeah. That, right. that, and you can kind of like hop on, hop off. And so, exactly. yeah, so to give someone the visual of that, so you're saying, you know, you might, um, you might have gotten off um, prematurely, but if I'm understanding this correctly, you can just hop back on. Is that also part of the yes. mentality? Yes. Although, in fact, with that particular story, she said it wasn't worth me hopping back on. <laughs> I, it would be better to just start at the beginning again, um, which, you know, I haven't decided um, whether, you know, I could rewrite it if I wanted to, it would just be work, you know, it would be a lot of work, but I love the idea of it. Um, and so I think I would probably take the ending um, and maybe I would rewrite the beginning because the ending was actually the thing that, you know, that I think she did like, but um, yeah, it's, so I got up too soon and um, the magic roundabout is a kid's program in England. I grew up with this, the magic roundabout, you can see it on YouTube. So that's kind of how the name came to pass. But, you know, it's easily done for anyone. And even um, esteemed writers like like Nina with, you know, 30 years of published novels and stories and multiple awards, Nebula Awards, all, all of these awards, still is writing stories and will send them out and gets them rejected, you know. So that is just part of a writer's life, no matter... There isn't a level that you get to where something doesn't get rejected. Um, so that's just what we have to do is understand what we're trying to do and take it to its fullest incarnation. And then we can say, okay, I've done what I could with that. Yeah, I hope that's a reassuring for anyone listening that you realize that it doesn't matter what level you get at. Uh, you know, the, the top writers, the top authors, they have quote unquote failures or things that don't work, things that bomb. Um, you know, I certainly hear from plenty of writers who are like, uh, or sometimes this may be their first draft uh, is like just horrible. And, and that's another thing. Um, one of my business partners, Ben Potwa, he, he says, uh, like, don't compare your 
uh, first draft or someone else's final draft. You know, the right. idea and, like, yeah. And the thing is too, that that final draft, you know, in the marketplace, there are teachers who are teaching and they, they tend to be genre writers, um, fine genre writers, fine teachers who will teach that you can write a story in one draft and they describe that, you know, you learn how to think as you're writing. And so I'm not saying that that's not possible. There certainly are a few writers that I know of, not personally, but I know of who can do it and have done it. But for the vast majority of people, if you're writing from emotion, um, you don't know, you haven't fully formed that emotion. You haven't crystallized what the problem is, what the character is. And so that first draft writing is impossible for many, many, many people. And it doesn't matter whether you do or don't do it. But I actually spent months and months trying, thinking I ought to be able to do that last year, um, studying to do that. And finally realized that's that's just not how I write. I'm, I'm not that kind of writer. Mm. Um, you know, maybe you, with flash fiction, sometimes, you know, something will pop out on the page and you give it a light revision and send it out and it gets published. And, you know, that can happen um, every now and then that can happen. But for something longer with plotting, um, it's years and years of understanding story structure, understanding how the reader perceives certain events and what the effect is on them. Um, and, and that's something that's an advanced writer's work. So when you hear about that, it can be very undermining. And also most people do not share how many um, drafts and how many people have helped in the creation of a story. They, they keep it to themselves. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, I, I think in a, in a kind of world, people would share that more freely. Yeah. A couple of great points there. So first of all, uh, the person could feed into that self doubt if they're comparing themselves to others and going, well, this other author is able to just do it in, in one go. Um, but maybe that's either not how your work, maybe you're it's comparing another person's strengths with, you might have different strengths or you might have a different style. And, uh, I heard someone else say, it's like, um, judging a, a fish by how well it can climb a tree or something like that. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's still good at being a fish. Or it's just like, it's just got a different skill set. So, yeah, no, um, that's a really great point. It, that's that's one way of looking at it. Another thing is also, I mean, just speaking specifically to the idea of, um, you know, whether you can do something in one draft or not. A lot of times I imagine that people who can do it in one one go, they have probably years and years of experience in getting feedback. I think of yeah. musicians who, yeah, you know, top level musicians can just improvise a, a song and just play it off the top of their head. And uh, like I can hear a you know, great musician who they'll play something, they'll improvise something that could take another musician like a year to try to write something that wouldn't be as good as what, you know, just a master could just like, yes. just, you know, yeah. unleash in a moment. But that comes from practice, that comes from mastery, but also uh, going just slightly down the, the musician uh, rabbit hole here. I think it was Beethoven and Mozart. Uh, Mozart would just hear like complete songs in his head and then just write it out. Whereas I think Beethoven uh, would tend to like go back and forth and like really flesh something out and have like more revisions if I'm remembering my music history correctly. But both of like, you're not in the grand scheme of history, they're both like legendary. Uh, there was talked about hundreds of years later, they just had different styles and that's right. the whole, whole thing. Right. They had different workflows and it's not like, it's, it's not like you try to force yourself to fit someone else's mold. You're going to find oh. your, your workflow. Right. And you also have to be willing to understand the writer that you are and come to peace with that. Because if you are trying desperately to be something that you're not right now, then you can shoot yourself in the foot and not ever get to the page the way that you could. The solution to all of this is to establish for yourself a loose um, system of writing. So I say loose only because um, there is a creative process. We, creatives need rest. You know, we don't set goals like other people set goals, or rather we don't set goals. That we might set goals in other areas that have to be hard and fast. But in the area of creativity, your goals 
have to be flexible because you're following as a writer, as an artist, you're following your excitement and you're, you're following your intuition and your enthusiasm. And the way you know what that is, is your excitement. It's your curiosity. It's that thing you want to write about. So you can write yourself. The reason the Tuesday sprints work so well is because we, we write from Tuesday to Tuesday. Those are the only goals we set because if we set Tuesday to Tuesday goals, monthly goals and yearly goals will take care of themselves. So what you do is you just get rid of all the other nonsense that's in your head and you say, okay, I would like to write a short story. Um, How much time do I have available? When can I do this? And so maybe you're someone who can wake up in the morning and you can do three or four mornings a week, half an hour, maybe even five minutes is good. That's a tick in my box. In In my book, that's a tick in a box because the key is keeping the door open to your to your story, to your creativity. Um, so you want a system. You want to know that you're showing up for yourself. And if you are showing up for yourself, everything else is going to fall into place. Great. So um, as, we, as we start to wrap it up, I, there's one other point I wanted to uh, touch upon that you brought up where it's like your manuscript, you know, uh, got torn to shreds, so to speak, uh, to the feedback. And yet you can still hop back on, even if it's not with that exact story or whatever. I think about my first book barely sold, but I was able to take repurpose that and write another book later as my writing improved. And I had the ingredients, or at least I needed to go through that process to get my ideas out there and then reshape it later. So it's like, the, the roundabout or the, the merry-go-round, it's like it, it's always going. It's, your, it's like you have the whole rest of your life as a creative and as a writer to hop back on. And it might take the shape of a new manuscript or whatever, but it's like you still had to go through that stepping stone experience in using 100%. all of that feedback. Yeah. 100%. And that's one of the tips that I give in going from getting inspired to first draft because when you get inspired, you pick up a story um, that makes you want to write, right? Let's say your mind is a blank. You want to write a story, but you don't know what you're going to write about. So you pluck a book off your shelf. You know, it's maybe a favorite. Um, for me, William Trevor and Alan Bennett are, if I read them, I cannot help but want to write. Um, so if you don't have that, it's really helpful to identify one or two books that make you feel like that. So you pluck that off the shelf and and now you're inspired to write but you're full of ambition like you're full of ambition to create something that looks like for me it's William Trevor or Alan Bennett you know and what I have to realize as I move from getting inspired to the first draft is I have to dial down my ambition because if I don't it's so painful you know it's like ah I I want to write this fabulous thing, but in the first stage, I I can't necessarily do that. In the first stage, what I can do is I can think of the character and I can see the situation and I can hear the dialogue maybe, you know, depending what comes first, and I can begin to get what's happening to that person down on the page. But I can't do what William Trevor and Alan Bennett have done in those published books that I'm plucking off the shelf. I can't get from here to there like that. You know, I have to go through stages. And so dialing down your ambition in the early drafts is really important. Yeah, I, I, that's so, such a good point. And talk about it like lowering the bar. And we hear so much about high achiever, raise the bar, strive for greatness. And it's like, yes, and uh, going into the fitness world, it's like you don't just uh, like, I guess you could actually think of an actual pole vaulter, like they might warm up first, you know, they, they kind of start with something easier. You might, uh, do a jog before you do an all out sprint, or you like warm up the muscles. If you're lifting weight before you like put the heaviest weight on or whatever, like you got to ease into it. Um, there's a gradual process and it's the same thing with writing. If I go, okay, Derek, sit down and write a masterpiece. (laughs) Like it's so much pressure, uh, that you'd put on yourself. Uh, and that's or, what you're doing. If yeah. you if you get inspired by something and, and that's in your mind as you're writing, then that on its own can be enough to stop you dead. Yeah. So you allow yourself to build up into it and, and evolve. So yeah, this has been. Shift. 
this has been fantastic. I want to make sure people can find out more information about you. You run these sprints. Uh, if you want to share anything about that, uh, uh, how can yeah. people find out more? Um, well, my website is tessasmithmcgovern.com and um, there's a page there where a, a tab at the top that says free sprint and that's where the updated link is always there. Um, and we start with five minutes of chat um, about obstacles and successes of the week. Um, and then there's usually some sort of mini lesson for anyone who wants it. And people can just mute me and start writing if they if they know they're ready to go. Um, and then we usually write for about 50 minutes. And then we discuss what we wrote um, and we talk about any we set our intentions for the week and talk about any obstacles we're anticipating and brainstorm ideas. Um, and then there's usually about half an hour Q and a afterwards, which is they can and ask me anything on writing or publishing. So, um, and that's free because um, it's through the Westport library. So, so that's the main thing. Oh, and I am, I'm teaching a class at um, the writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence. Um, in March on how to link your short stories and memoirs into a collection. Okay, great. So we'll have links uh, to that along with this. So that's uh, T-E-S-S-A, uh, Tessa, then Smith, S-M-I-T-H, and then McGovern, M-C-G-O-V-E-R-N.com. So that'll be there. Uh, and any... Uh, Thank you so much for sharing all this, uh, all these great insights. Any final takeaways or uh, any last point that you want to make before we wrap this up? I do want to say that something I said to this morning on my sprint, because it's Tuesday, um, I've never in, in 22 plus years of, of writing, of teaching writing, I've never had a student who didn't have any talent. And I think that you know, I'm not, everybody has something to learn, but there was never anyone who, who had nothing. And I think that you don't want to write if you don't have a talent for it. Um, but that said, talent is built. It's not born in my mind. I know that there are people who are born with it, but you know, I, my kids are 27 and 24 and I saw over the years how they built their talents and, the practice and the absorbing of certain information. So I just want to say that, that, you know, this is available to anyone who has the impulse for it. And if you're drawn to writing, there's going to be a reason. And, you know, it's a form of you know, don't sabotage yourself. Give, you give it a go and give it a try. Um, and that's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Tessa. Sure. Thank you very much.